Start. Good evening and welcome to the School of Vocational Agricultural High School, the regular meeting of the Board of Trustees. Today is Tuesday, May 17th. I'd like to ask for a call to order. Mike Kaling. Present. Tilly Spencer Robinson. Present. Richard Quadro is going to be late. Mayor Ciara. Here. John Provost. Here. This time, can we stand for a pledge of allegiance? To the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Right. <clears throat> this time, I'd like to read the mission statement. Smith Vocational Agricultural High School is a prepare student for social responsibility employment and post-secondary education through rigorous applied technical and academic programs. Is there any participation by the public this evening? Yes. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, my participation is surrounding the senior banquet that we have coming up. And in the past, the board has very nicely um, subsidized the faculty payment for the dinner, approximately 50%. Um, I would like to ask you to subsidize it as you would yours. Um, in the past, the board has gone for free, and so has the administration. So I don't care if you give me 50%, I don't care if you give me none, as long as that's what you give yourself. And of course, I'm really putting in there for 100%, but um, I would just like it to be equal right across for everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Um, I want to just make a note that there will be no executive session tonight that could possibly be listed on your agenda. <clears throat> Is there any participation? I have something very short. Um, I'm delighted to report that uh, I will be representing the PTO of the uh, Smith Vocational Agricultural High School at the Florence Savings Bank uh, Awards next week at the Garden House. So Great. we're getting an award. We don't know what uh, what the award will be, but right. we're excited that we have um, gotten some money. So. Congratulations. All right. At this time, we have a motion and a second to approve the minutes of the April 12, 2022 and April 26, 2022 Board of Trustees meetings. So moved. Second. Could I get one piece of feedback Please. for that? Um, I want to appreciate the excellent job that is done by Ms. Carver. Um, I always feel accurately represented in the minutes, and it's a lot of information to summarize, and she does it, um, I, I just think, just so um, beautifully. Uh, the changes that I requested that I observed in the last one were made. I wanted to appreciate that. Um, I noticed from our April 26th meeting, because I very much enjoyed reading them, um, the number that the police chief uh, cited for how many animals would be, um, or how many days animals would be in the facility. I believe she said it was 180, and in our minutes it says 150, but please correct me if I'm wrong. The 180 stuck in my head because it's the uh, length of the school year, and so I thought that was a bit interesting. Yeah. Um, but whatever the number is, in case we ever need to refer to it again, um, as we, you know, embark on this adventure, I think it would be good to know, you know, so that we can report to the public how many days will the facility be used. I'll reach out to the okay. Awesome, thank you. Okay. It might be my memory. Okay. So, are there any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, this time I'd like to turn the meeting over uh, to Joe for school spotlight. Yeah, we're going to have uh, Skills USA, I believe, do a pre talk okay. uh, on the upcoming national. Mr. Lamar, you're up. Hi, hi everybody. I'm nervous. I'm usually giving my spiel in front of a bunch of kids here. So. Uh, I'm Carmen Lamar, one of the plumbing instructors here on campus, uh, also one of the Skills Advisors, and I have uh, um, our other uh, Skills Advisor here with us tonight, Ms. Sherman, which was a nice surprise because I was told that she had training tonight, so it's nice that uh, we both could be here. Uh, so for those of you, I know most of you know what Skills USA is, but for those of you that don't, uh, it's a competition-based program that we have here at the school. Uh, all the students are involved, and um, there's a couple, we'll call them tiers, I guess, to uh, the competitions. The first uh, tier would be districts, 
Um, to get to districts, um, Mr. Sherman and myself, we usually leave it up to the shops. There's some shops that have a lot of interest in Skills USA, some that, that you know don't have too much. They usually take volunteers. Um, I know in the, in the plumbing shop, we have a lot of kids that are, are looking to go. We only can send uh, four kids. Um, so I, I do a shop competition, and I you know I do it between um, some book work and some hands-on stuff to try to get the most well-rounded students to, to um, you know, participate in Skills and, and represent the shop. Um, I think there's what, seven or eight other schools in our district that we compete against. Uh, for instance, Franklin Tech, Putnam, uh, McCann, uh, schools like that. In the past, uh, districts has been held at McCann, uh, but with, of course, things going on, they moved that to a, uh, a virtual computer-based test. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so the last couple of years, it's, it's been on computer here at the school. Uh, we've actually done very well at that. We've had a, a lot of kids score really well, really high. Um, and if the students do well enough in the district and they earn a gold or silver medal uh, at the district level, they get a chance to move on to the state level. State level, uh, which thank God for, for the first time in two years, was back in uh, Upton, Mass at Blackstone Valley. Beautiful school uh, for an in-person competition. And uh, that's one of my personal favorites to watch. And the, you have the plumbers, you know, snapping cast iron and gluing PVC together. You have the, uh, the electricians. Uh, mounting boxes and running wire, and the automotive kids are changing tires and checking oil and doing electrical diagnostics. And the criminal justice kids are paired up with the state police and they're doing traffic stops and drug searches and the well, commercial bakers <laughs> doing cupcakes and cakes and cookies. And it's just a phenomenal thing to watch. It's really, really cool to watch the kids do what they do, you know, step out of their, their comfort level and, you know, just, just perform to the best of their abilities. Uh, again, Smith Vocational does very, very well there. We pulled uh, seven state medals this year. We had uh, three gold, two silver, and two bronze, I believe, right? Was the right for sure? Yeah. yeah. Um, so um, at the state level, only the gold medal recipients get a chance to move on to the national level. Um, and this year, the national level, for the first time, is going to be held in Atlanta, Georgia. And that's the week of the 20th through the 25th. Um, and again, very much like the state competition, uh, it's a hands-on competition, I believe. Um, some contests do have a written portion where they'll take an employability test about resumes and some soft skills and stuff like that. Uh, but the, the bulk of it is, is the hands-on portion. Uh, we have a student from, from plumbing, a student from uh, criminal justice, and a student from uh, automotive. Uh, it's going to be hopefully going down to New Zealand for the first time. Yep. Yeah. Um, being in Atlanta, um, like I said, I'm not really sure what to expect down there because it is going to be our first time. But uh, speaking from experience, having traveled down to Kentucky um, last what, four or five years, uh, it, it's a great time. It's a uh, it's a huge trade show. There's all kinds of uh, Texpo things going on. Um, there's a bunch of freebies if you want to walk around with a little bag. You get filled up with pens and pencils and pads and all kinds of good stuff. Free T-shirts, hats, you name it, they got it down there. Um, and, and again, it's just an amazing thing to watch. You know, the kids. Um, all kinds of competitions going on. They have just tractor trailer trucks that they bring in with uh, you know wood for the cabinet makers and pipes for the plumbers and tires and you know all, all kinds of stuff and, and just the amount of, of recognition for the school and the, and the tools and scholarships and clothing and stuff that the kids just get for showing up just for being the best in their state making it to the national competition is, is amazing. Um, we've had um, several kids in the past that, uh, that have won nationals um, and that they, you know, they told me, Mr. Lamore, a FedEx truck and a UPS truck, you know, just backed up to my garage door and just unloaded everything and from, you know, tens of thousands of dollars worth of tools these kids get for, for winning. And it's just, it's a fantastic thing. Um, so I'm, I'm really excited to, <clears throat> right, excited to go. I'm looking forward to it. Um, like I said, I think we're going to have a great time down there. And I know our kids are going to do well because we have, uh, you know, the best faculty, best staff, and I think we're going to knock it out of the park. Questions? So in the in the years I've been sitting here, it seems like the intergalactic champion of skills comes from plumbing uh, year after year. So I'm just wondering, is there anything we can do to help spread the wealth to some other departments to help them go deeper in the competition? Well, uh, this year, I mean, it, it's it's tough. I mean, we, we have to comb through the, the technical standards. Each contest, there's a specific list of things, of, of competencies and stuff that they're expected to know and when the kids go there. Um, and it's just, you know, part of our success is, is knowing the competition. Um, I tell the kids, I, I said the, the, the state level to, to me, to us, 
is more difficult than the national level. Uh, but that's not to take away any, you know, anything from any other state competitors. It's, it's just the, uh, the having the stringent code that we have in Massachusetts uh, for plumbers is it helps us out immensely. Um, you know, so you get down there and you're seeing things. It's like, oh my God! I remember the, the first time I went down there. We have um, what they call a cast iron car, and we make several types of them. <clears throat> the ratchet one. It's got two knuckles that sit on a shaft. And the kid was just reefing on it, and there ain't a wrench big enough in the world to see to unseat that thing. So that kid was done from from the get go. I felt bad, but it's just uh, you know, like I said, just just knowing the competition, I think, really helps us out a lot, knowing what to expect. Uh, it's a phenomenal opportunity for our students, and I'm so appreciative of all of the work that both of you do to make this happen. It's it's an incredible undertaking. Um, both of my children participated in um, in skills, and uh, for my daughter, it was a an academic teacher who recommended her for the math related competition, which I didn't know that there were academic components of the Skills USA. Mm -hmm. But it was just uh, um, the the whole experience for her. It really helped launch her to a, a new level in terms of her confidence, um, in terms of, of, of how she saw herself, uh, her her own performance and abilities. Um, and my son did it because I asked him to because <laughs> it was such a great experience for, for my daughter. And he had a fantastic, he had a great, it was just before the pandemic yep. um, at McCann. And he had such a great day to be around all those young people. I would love to go and see com a competition on what we've done at all some right. point to the energy. Um, it is, it's, it's a great thing. I really yeah, appreciate that. So I know it's also like, um, to Dr. Provost's point, it's, you know, intrinsic motivation. Students choose themselves because it's a lot, a lot of extra work and it's a lot of hoops to jump through to get there. Um, so, you know, it, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure that plays in. That's, the, the teachers can only do so much. Yeah, but really appreciate the opportunity. To do. And just to see the look on the kids' face, you know, because we ask them on the bus ride home, say, you know, I think that, like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. And then they sit there for awards and they hear, you know, Smith Vocational, and then they hear their name, it's just like, Yes! <laughs> and, you know, of course, Ms. Sherman and I are one of the biggest cheerleaders. I'm like, yes! So, it would be pretty cool. So, from the Board of Trustees, I'd like to make a comment that I want to thank you, your staff, uh, Tara, and the, the people that are coming down from the school to supervise the kids. Because it's important that parents know when they trust the children to us to go to these out-of-state trips that somebody's watching and we're helpful. And if somebody needs something, we're there to guide them. So I know it's a big job. It's a lot of responsibility. And you make us proud every year with the whole staff that attends these conventions and skills contests. And I can't be proud of the amount of years that I've been involved to, when I get on my soapbox, as Andy will attest, we, uh, we, we had an opportunity to uh, speak in front of the Rotary Club of Northampton recently in the skills contest was on the top of it and I spoke about not only district, uh, national, but international. <coughs> and that's your forte that you have been able to bring that in the whole and I just want the whole audience to know that I can't say enough about what you folks do. Thank you. That's great, thank you. Can I just say that? Yes, yeah, this absolutely. Is, this is such a joy to learn about, so thank you. And just your your obvious Support and excitement is infectious, and the, the students are just so lucky to have to have you and the rest of Thank the you. teachers and the staff leading them. Um, and I just wish you the best of luck, but it doesn't seem like Thank you, you need we'll it. Thank you. So we'll <laughs> Well, any luck, hopefully I'll be back here this time next year telling you that we have uh, two kids in the running to go to France. So that's that's, right. that's my goal. Yeah. Well, yeah. Awesome. I would just say this demeanor is very calm right now. <laughs> 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 Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to turn over to our superintendent. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. All right. Good evening. It seems like it's been a while since I've had a more traditional report. We've been living and swimming and breathing and whatnot in the budget. But uh, this evening, we're back to our the traditional report. I have a couple of highlights to share. And then some topics that we'll probably be discussing voted on later in the agenda. I just want to take the liberty to, to give some background, some context for the board. So when we get into the voting section of the meeting, we'll have some, some of that context to, to vote on. So some highlights over the past month. Uh, back on the 14th of April, so right before April vacation, 
Uh, we had the MAVA Outstanding Student of the Year of Celebration uh, in Worcester. Uh, speaking about the pandemic, it was great to get back into Worcester uh, and, and, and celebrate all of the students across the Commonwealth. It's amazing when you sit there and you read the, well, you listen to the, the biographies, uh, what these adolescents are doing nowadays, uh, not only in high school, but in their aspirations after high school. And, and in fact, one of the, the student that we have from Smith is going to be one of the students down at Atlanta. So we have an all-star from, from Smith uh, that we celebrated statewide, and she'll be down in Atlanta in a few weeks. And as I already mentioned, we had April vacation. We came back from that. Mr. Canley and I already mentioned uh, that he and I uh, were invited, and we spoke about Smith to the Rotary Club. Uh, I think that was a wonderful opportunity. I was very impressed by the, the number and quality of questions uh, that the members asked of us. They were very impressed by the school, very impressed by the students. Uh, one example was, uh, I forget his day job, he may be a, a realtor, but I think he was affiliated also with a, a local fire department. And we're talking about safety in OSHA. <clears throat> and this individual is saying that uh, as the safety officer for this local volunteer fire department, uh, he does not trust himself as a realtor and many of the adults who have other types of day jobs. Uh, they trust the Smith Vocational Volunteer Firefighters, especially those who work in forestry or in the forestry program, because they deal with heavy equipment all day long. Uh, they would much rather to give our student the keys to the fire truck to back the fire truck up because of the safety protocols that we have here at Smith. So I think this is a true testament to what we're doing here uh, with our students. Skills USA, we've already talked about. Um, yes, I was down there at the state level. It is a highlight. The only thing that's, that's greater than the state level is the, the, the national level. Uh, I went back my first year here at Smith. Uh, I had the opportunity uh, to fly down to Kentucky. Ms. Wimette was lucky enough to have uh, our student from cosmetology was at the national level down there. And uh, I had a, a newfound hope for the country, honestly. When you walk around there, you, you, you can't help but soak in the energy level, soak in the hope. Uh, these students are unbelievable. And all you hear about in the media is how awful this country is going and, and where the students are going nowadays. Uh, if you have the opportunity, get to the state level, get to the national level. It will open up your eyes and see that we're in good hands with the next generation. So, yes, that happened back on April 29th. Uh, we had a, a MAVA Board of Directors meeting that same day at Skills. Uh, the superintendents, you know, we had our own meeting, just talking about various uh, issues at, at the vocational level statewide. We had that Board of Directors meeting during Skills. The following week on uh, May 5th, unfortunately, I had COVID uh, that particular week, so I was out for the week, uh, but I was able to hop on and, and listen to the commissioner. I have some updates. Uh, one big update I just want to share with the board. Uh, during COVID, uh, they came out with, they being DESE, came out with an emergency license. Uh, the idea was because of COVID was happening, the shutdown, it was next to impossible for aspiring teachers to become licensed because how can they get a pass of the test if the test wasn't being offered because we were shut down. Uh, so the DESE came out with the emergency license. There was a bit of a snafu originally though in, in the, the original regulations that a stipulation for the emergency license, a candidate had to have a bachelor's degree, uh, which is fine on the academic side. But on the vocational side, many of our vocational shops do not require a bachelor's degree to teach at a particular shop. So it automatically excluded anybody who wanted to become a vocational teacher to earn an emergency license. So as MAVA officers, we were appealing that over the last couple of years. They just came out with a new rendition of the emergency license, and they dropped that piece for the vocational candidates. So uh, if we are looking for any candidates or we're struggling to hire anybody, we can have a candidate apply for an emergency license on the vocational side without a bachelor's degree. So that was some positive news that finally came out. Uh, we had a, a DESE-CDE update call in the following week. Again, several topics, uh, really nothing new to report. Uh, this past week we had the National Honor Society induction ceremony. Again, finally getting back to normal. We finally have another ceremony in person. Uh, Ms. Dumas, Emily Dumas, is one of our history teachers. Uh, she is also the advisor for NHS. She uh, did a wonderful job with, with the ceremony. Basically two years of celebration, trying to uh, celebrate the current seniors who had no opportunity last year's juniors to celebrate, and obviously the, the new juniors. So uh, that happened last Thursday. Great, great opportunity, great experience. And then finally, uh, yesterday, I'll talk a little bit more in a couple more slides. Uh, we had a meeting with the Hilltown Community Health uh, Center and uh, we will talk about the grant that they received, the statewide grant for the school-based health center here at Smith. So I'll talk about that in more detail in a couple of slides. But that meeting occurred yesterday. As I already mentioned, COVID, uh, I've been sharing these, you know, these numbers with the board over the last few months. 
just kind of give you a four week, it's actually a five week uh, summary because uh, we had a two week reporting period because of April vacation. But back on uh, April 13th, we had one student and one staff. We were very low. And we've, we've been gradually increasing, unfortunately, over the last few weeks. And then uh, over the, the course of a two week reporting period, we had five students and again, only one staff. So again, nothing too major. And then the week of May 4th, so Wednesday, May 4th, I had a report that we had nine students and three staff, me being one of the three. And then this past Wednesday, I had a report that we had 12 students and four staff. So again, not exponentially a, a, a major problem, uh, but something that we're keeping an eye on. Uh, and talking to the school nurses every week, we're hanging in there, we're doing okay. I would assume after April vacation that we're removed from April vacation by a couple of weeks. Uh, and listening to the commissioner uh, last week, a couple weeks ago now, uh, it seems like we're probably going to plateau, hopefully begin to go back down a little bit. Right. Are the staff able to bounce back um, physically, or are there any long-term absences? Um, that hasn't been really long-term. Some of us have had symptoms and haven't really felt well. Other staff, like, I don't know why, I'm, I'm feeling fine, so they bounce back just like that. It, it's been a mess. But nobody's been out really beyond, I was out six days, actually, five days, um, or because of a weekend, help me. But uh, some people have no problems, other people have been five, six days. And have you been able to find subs? Yes. I mean, we're, we're struggling with subs in, in general. Uh, right now, the, the time of year dealing with COVID, on top of COVID, we're dealing with just other illnesses uh, that, are, that are occurring, plus um, personal days and so on and so forth. So we are pretty tight right now, but we haven't had a shutdown, which is good. <laughs> Any other questions about this particular topic? The commissioner did not warn us. He gave us a recommendation you know, that we may want to have some PPE available for the fall. Okay, if we ever have to look at masks in the fall, uh, we definitely have masks in stock. We definitely stocked up, so that's not a problem at this point. So NEAC, we've been talking about this over the last couple of months. The board charged me to sort of investigate, come back to the board with some data, uh, and that's my task this evening, uh, along with my recommendation. So, in talking to Ms. Farron, uh, who is at actually her MASBO uh, School Business Administrative Conference this week, that's why she's not here this evening, uh, but I asked Ms. Farron to give me the 10-year report on the financial obligation that we, we paid to NEAS to be a member. Over the past 10 years, we paid a total of $58,378, so on average about $5,800 a year. That's more than the, the annual membership, but that includes our major visit, which is several thousand dollars to, to bring the big team in. And then in year five, we have a smaller focus team that also comes back out for a site visit. Those two years are big financial impacts. Uh, the other year is it's about $3,000, give or take, for an annual membership. Um, so there is a substantial investment in, in being a member of TNAS, $58,000 over the course of the past decade. I asked our guidance staff to reach out to all the local colleges to ask them, would there be any impact uh, if we withdrew from the ask? What would the impact be on our graduates who want to get into colleges? Would there be any issues there? And uh, all the responses back, I think we had 10 local colleges that responded to us, uh, very little, if any, impact on the admissions for any of our graduates. Basically, they do not look at accreditation as a, a stipulation for admission, which is great news. Uh, there were some concerns uh, a couple of colleges raised that said you may want to be weary of uh, the FAFSA, so student, student aid, that the federal government may look at the federal aid and accreditation sort of tied hand in hand. So there might be an impact, uh, just to be aware and to be fully transparent to the board. Uh, but as far as admissions go into a college, very little impact, but it may impact financially. Faculty, so I, I had a short presentation to the faculty at a recent meeting. I asked Mr. Bianca to send out a survey to the staff to say, you know, if they had sort of that magic wand, if they had the choice, should we stay, should we pull out? 67.9%, uh, so nearly 68% of the staff said, let's stay in. Uh, let's not pull out at this point. So the majority of staff want to remain a member of NEAC. Sort of the, the overall theme of why, uh, it was uh, we understand the concerns, we understand the financial impact, we understand what's happening with my special reports and the facilities, and can we really fix that problem? Is it really our fault? Uh, but are we really in a position to pull out? What happens? Do we really want to be that leader? We want to be a leader in education, but do we want to lead that particular charge? You know, 
but let's see what happens with those other schools. Specifically, we had some staff who reached out to me to say, um, because there have been traditional schools who have pulled out of NEAC, but what about the vocational world? How many vocational schools have pulled out? <clears throat> so that board meeting down at Skills I, I mentioned, you know, that I attended, I asked that question to all the superintendents that were sitting around the table. Any of you pull out of NEAC? Not one. Uh, so that's my last bullet. Uh, so all the superintendents that were at the board meeting, nobody has pulled out any ask at this point. So with that said, I mean, with all of the, the data I've just shared, talking internally with the leadership team, uh, the issue of us having to make a decision is there's a major impact next year. If we stay in, I have to tell Mr. Bianca uh, that he's going to be in charge of a self uh, the self-study next year. Uh, and I want to make that recommendation that at this point, I will not recommend, I to turn it around to a positive, I recommend remaining a member of NEAC at this point. Uh, I, I do see some benefits, uh, despite some of the drawbacks. So I'm not going to ask for an official vote. I think we're just going to continue down the road of remaining a member. If the board disagrees, by all means, you can vote. Uh, but that's where I stand this evening. Any comments, questions? So um, you described sort of a large group coming and then a smaller group and separated by five years. So is next year, is that one of those groups? So next year would be like is it year 10. It's basically the year before the big 10 year, which would be the big team. So next year we have to do a self-study. We basically self-assess our own situation, compare ourselves to the, the standards. We submit that self-study to NEAC. The following year, they send out a big team, and they compare what did we say we are and how we're doing compared to the standards. They write the reports. That's the big visit the following year. Okay. And then five years after that, there'll be a smaller team that comes out and say, based on that big report that they're going to provide us, they're going to give us commendations and recommendations. So commendations are pats on the back. The recommendations are we need to work on these areas. Five years down the road, they're going to come out and say, how did you do towards those recommendations? Uh, hopefully that we've met all those recommendations. And then the idea is after year five, we begin to ramp up again for the next cycle. So are we having this discussion now? Because if we were to pull out, this would be the optimal time in the 10 year cycle to do it. The reason I brought it up, full transparency, that I, I'm asked twice a year to submit a special report to NEAC. The biggest issue that we have is around facilities. And the bigger issue above facilities is the governance model. So NEAC feels that our facilities, specifically D building, is a concern. Uh, and how do we as a school deal with our facility capital issues? Uh, and as we all know, as a governance model, it's difficult for us as a school to handle some of our capital issues, i.e. a new building. Uh, in a traditional district, a school needs a new building, we go to the town, uh, typically there's an override, we pay for a new building. Uh, here at Smith with the governance model, that's a little bit more complicated. <clears throat> so NEAC is saying that's a difficult situation. You need to figure this out. 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40 years from now, how do we solve this problem uh, as these buildings continue to age and age and age and age? Uh, so they asked me to write a special report. I submitted a special report that says the same thing that I said six months ago, that we're doing the best job that we, we could possibly do. I pat Mr. Smith and his team on the back. I pat the city on the back for helping us out with the capital improvements. We're doing everything we can possibly do. But I can't change a governance model. I can't change that layer. Uh, but within the world that we're living in, we're doing a pretty darn good job. Uh, how many times can I say the same report, send the same report, they send the same thing saying, we approve, we're gonna keep you sort of in that probation warning status. Uh, the last special report, they threatened to pull the accreditation from us. Uh, I, could, I provided a just cause letter uh, to say because of COVID, because of everything else, please give us a break. They accepted that. So my concern was, at what point will NEAC say, we're done kicking the can down the road, we're going to pull your accreditation? And is that our fault if we lose the accreditation? And what did that do for us as a school? And if we lose the accreditation, what did that do? Compared to saying, NEAC, you've lived your life, we don't need you, let's just pull out. That was the debate, the debate I brought up. Yeah, so you still have those concerns. Oh, they're still there. We still run the risk of losing the accreditation. Can I just have some Mr. Sievers from NEAS is one of the key people. In some of the meetings that we've been in, they said to us, we will go to bat for you with the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, with the city of Northampton, and support your efforts to get in the building. Uh, but 
doesn't really happen. And, and they never really stepped up in regards to, they talked a great story, but they never came through 100% on that endeavor. So, you know, some of the, the things, even though we're paying the money, uh, the delivery of, of what they're saying, other than giving us a hard time about our buildings and the way we operate, uh, you know, some of the reasons that were originally looked at about pulling out were justified for us. And, uh, but because of the study that Andy did in regards to the other vocational schools staying in, nobody else has pulled out, we don't want to be the first one. Uh, so we're going to write it out for another year. A couple points, just to piggyback that. Uh, part of the last special report where they determined they'll, I, I was able to save the accreditation by telling them, we've done all of this work, don't punish us because of the pandemic. <clears throat> so they said we will accept that, but part of the response was also they want receivers to come out and speak to me face to face and talk about what is our game plan. So he did, we met back in January, I think it was, February, somewhere in that range. And, um, and we had a heart to heart and we talked. And I told Bruce face to face that I am thinking about recommending to the board that we pull off. So he heard that from me. Uh, I think he understands he doesn't want to lose us as a member, obviously. Uh, one positive I will have to give Bruce and, and the AC credit for, and as a board, you voted to allow this to happen. Uh, Bruce drafted a letter to send to the commissioner, Commissioner Riley, on our behalf, trying to advocate that the commissioner needs to step up and help us. Uh, so he drafted that letter, the board voted and said, yes, we can send it. So I told Bruce he can send that letter, he did. So the big picture is, uh, because of the pandemic, prior to the pandemic, we had, we had some movement going. We had legislators coming out, we had a legislative breakfast, we had some buy-in, um, we had a vision, and then everything stopped. Uh, we were at the point where we needed to get the commission out here. So now we need to get that ball rolling again. So big vision, I think we'll talk over the summer, uh, would be that we want to have a legislative breakfast again uh, this fall, get this ball rolling again, um, and allow NEAC to hopefully support us as much as possible. So they did write a letter, so we'll see if it helps. Thank you for all of that explanation. I, some of it sounds familiar, so I recognize you're probably repeating it for me. Um, so I, just, I apologize, but I'm trying to look through it. Question. Uh, what does it matter to NEASC if we pull out? Why does it matter to them? I don't want to speak to them. But again, we've given $58,000 over the last 10 years. So, okay. So it's all about money? That's at least one reason. And I think it would just be, if I back off of that soapbox, if I was them, I want to have as many member <coughs> schools as possible, which increases their authority and their power within a region. So if they can have more member schools, then they have more authority when they advocate to the state houses. Because they, they don't only represent schools in Massachusetts, but all of New England. Uh, so I think they just, they, it provides them more power and more say when they're advocating for the schools if there's more member schools being there. <coughs> I appreciate all of the information that you're providing for us, explaining you know your thinking. Um, I appreciate also that you included faculty input into your thinking. You know, that's super important. Um, I want to come from a different angle. Of, you know, um, state accountability measures require lots of compliance, which is pretty onerous for our administrators. And I'm wondering. Um, the, about the extent to which um, that makes the ask and the ask accreditation redundant. So it's a whole lot more work for the same. It, it's it, how much is it, is the work redundant of the state of the Thank you. That was one of my major concerns about NEAC in my life previously when I was on the academic side. Um, I think NEAC or any accreditation agency, they were very important pre every form, pre MCAS. Uh, that's how, as a high school, that's how we were measured. And, and yes, it meant a lot for a high school to have that accreditation, because that was really the only benchmark that we had if we were a good school or not. And then every form came out, MCAS came out, the state accountability came out, and uh, there's so much more accountability beyond just those measurements uh, that there is some redundancy. And at the end of the day, when we read the newspaper about schools that are going to receivership or schools that are, are achieving poorly, it's not about NEAC accreditation. It's about the state accountability. Uh, so I agree. I do think NEAC, honestly, Andy, the superintendent, me personally, my personal opinion, 
is that it has sort of lived its life a little bit, um, but it's still there. Uh, so while I put more stock in the state accountability, and I think my job, and you hold me accountable more to the state accountability because you were meeting those benchmarks, uh, and less on NAAC, it's still there. Uh, and I do support the staff where that concern is, we want to be the first to pull out uh, in that potential pull out. So I'm torn there. Uh, I, I struggle with that. And I struggle with telling Mr. Bianca that next year, the vast majority of PD for our staff has to be focused on the self study. Could we use that time elsewhere in more important topics? I struggle with that. Uh, I will stand behind my recommendation at, at this point. Other comments, questions about this? <clears throat> so the school-based health center, let's talk about some good news. Um, so as you know, as a board, uh, we were approached a few months ago uh, by the Hilltown Health Group uh, that they wanted to apply for the state grant to fund a school-based health center here at Smith. And uh, on April 19th, they were notified by the state that Yes, in fact, they were awarded the money. It's about $150,000 over the next couple of years. The $150,000 earmarked for the equipment to sort of uh, equip the, the school-based health center. The problem is there's no space. Uh, and I, I was very honest and transparent with them from the get-go. We have no space here on campus. And they said, that's not a problem. We will fundraise. Uh, what they're hoping for is $2.5 million. It's their responsibility to fundraise that money so they can build a building for us here on, uh, on grounds. So we met yesterday. Uh, I want to thank Mr. Bianca, Mr. Smith, uh, Ms. Chardier, uh, who's representing the vocational shops because there might be a direct connection with our shops in building the building. Uh, we also had Ms. Farron, from the, obviously from the business finance perspective, and then we had uh, uh, Eliza, who is the executive director, and Alex, who is their fundraising grant guru. Uh, we sat around the table yesterday and talked about next steps. So I just want to share with the board, uh, we talked about Gateway. So Gateway Regional, uh, they are sort of the flagship program for school-based health centers here in Western Mass. Uh, the Hilltown Group supervises and organizes and, and, and manages that particular program. Uh, in talking to the new superintendent, Krista Smitty, over in Gateway, she was a former principal of Hampshire Regional. Uh, she's invited us over for a tour if we want, so we're going to set up that meeting so we can go over there more for Karen Gardner, our school nurse, so she can get her eyes on the program and answer a lot of operational questions of how does this all work. Uh, so we're going to be working on that meeting, that tour of Gateway uh, coming up relatively soon. We also talked about the fundraising. So even though the responsibility is going to be on them to raise $2.5 million, and that's their responsibility, and if they don't raise all $2.5 million, they're going to finance the, the balance. They, they, they are fully committed uh, to this particular project. Uh, but they, want, they need our help because we have a lot of contacts, and we talked about advisory as an example. Uh, so is there a way that we could tap into our advisory network? Uh, there might be some employers out there who see the, the value of this and, and may want, want to invest in fundraising donations and whatnot. Uh, so we'll be talking about those contacts. Uh, we'll be talking, uh, I want to thank Mr. Smith for the idea, some of our big time vendors. You know, we spend a lot of money. Uh, to, to buy supplies for our shops and, and the facilities. Maybe some of those, you know, the bigger name vendors might be willing to help us out as well. And board members, you are very connected in the community. You may tap into your, your connections as well to say, are there people that we, we should talk to? Uh, so, but again, the onus of the work will be coming from the Hilltown Health Group, but they just want our connections so they can you know, really target, you know, who's going to give us money because we're Smith. Uh, the hospital uh, is the big one. Uh, Elias actually sits on the board, so there's a good possibility that the, the hospital may step in and be a supporter as well. So that's a, an upcoming to-do list on uh, this, this action plan. I did talk to Eliza. Uh, I offered her this particular meeting, our June meeting, for her to come in and, and present to you as a board uh, what this looks like. Uh, because another step, which is down below, is developing an MOU, which has to happen. So what does this understanding and agreement look like? Uh, who pays the electric bill? Who pays for the water? Uh, how long are we agreeing for them to be on site with this particular program? Is this a 10-year agreement, 100-year agreement? So there's a lot of logistics that we have to work out that you as a board will have authority over. Uh, so we'll have to work through all of that. I'm sure Alan Seawall will have to happen to Alan Seawall's expertise as far as some of those understandings as well. Uh, so that has to happen. 
So I already mentioned the board uh, meeting in June. We talked about we we sort of educated them on the advisory structure that we have here at the vocational uh, school. So they want to come out. We have the fall program advisory probably in October. Uh, they are planning on providing a presentation to the advisories uh, in October. So those are some of the initial action items. The the grant, even though it's awarded as of July one, they have to start seeing students by the end of the 23-24 school year. So by June of 24, we have to have students in there being seen by uh, the practitioners. So it's basically two school years that we have for them to raise the money and for us to build a building. The vision is, if you know the White House, uh, there's land behind the White House right now, there's a deck off the back of the White House looking at the, the hospital property, you can visualize that. And I tell people, if you can think of a T, if you have the White House, and then you put this building, it'll look like a T from the air, that T will be, you know, this building will be behind the White House, up against the hospital property. Visualize where it's going to be. Uh, so, that's Cliff Notes version. I'll open up to comments, questions. I think that just the wheels turning here. Uh, we have our opportunity at the three county fair. I think this is a perfect fair for them to put a tent up with our in conjunction with our building down there, you know, our promotion. A lot of people from three counties are going to be down there for exposure. I think I'd like to open that door to invite them uh, to participate with us. Okay. I want to thank Deb. One of the questions that came from them yesterday was, uh, can they have a list of towns that our students are from? Uh, so thank you to Deb. She put it out immediately, including the staff. Because they want to not only target those particular towns, but the legislators and the senators who oversee those particular towns. So they're working on that as well. So. I think there could be some confidentiality issues involved with this, but I want you to know that um, Northampton High School was recently awarded the second innovation pathway in health assistance and, and social work. So there might be some opportunities for internship. You might be able to um, send capture workforce from our high school to um, assist when the time comes. So let's, let's ch chat about that. I know they ran away. I, I point out Ms. Yeah, Sherman. Uh, we, we talked about the opportunity internally with our health assisting program for co-ops, but that is definitely a confidentiality issue with our own students working with our students as a patient. But I'll keep that in mind because they're not really peers in the same school. So, yeah, thank you. It's just a wonderful opportunity. It's super exciting. I'm so glad that you were able to experiment this happening and take all of these steps to plan what comes next. It's so well thought out and will be such a great resource for our students. And you know, we talked to um, uh, school committee, or not school committees, but select boards in our seven districts. This will be uh, another resource for that to consider an asset. And it's a, a benefit for the students and the staff. So the potential patient pool would be current students and staff. So not only are we looking at hopefully retaining students, I think that's a, a great benefit, <coughs> potentially recruiting students if families know that we have the service here at Smith compared to the, the home district. No, but also staff, as we're trying to recruit uh, wonderful staff to come here, if they're debating Smith versus another high school, uh, well, we offer, you can come to work here, and you can have your car fixed, you can have your hair done, you can eat in a restaurant, and oh, by the way, when you're sick, you can see the doctor on site. Uh, I think it's a wonderful service and, and recruiting tool, or a retention tool for our staff as well. Any other questions? The retirement celebration. This is a, uh, an item on the agenda later. I just want to give you some back, background. So we got into a sort of a precedent over the last several years uh, in celebrating our retirees, obviously. And uh, just to give the board, a lot of you are new, the board traditionally recognizes retirees at a board meeting until we start doing the retirement dinners uh, with a clock, and the clock is made by our cabinet making students. So there's a gift that we traditionally give to the retirees from the board made by the cabinet making students. Unfortunately, because of COVID, again, we, we were never able to meet in person, we were never able to celebrate the retirees so the plan this year is to, and thank you to Ms. Carver yet again, uh, planning this wonderful dinner. We're looking at Wednesday, June 8th, beginning at 3 p.m. at Beaverbrook Golf Course. We think 3 p.m. because the staff get done around 2.40, they can go straight here up to Beaverbrook, and we can celebrate the retirees. So 
uh, you know, if we go later in the night, I think we'll lose them. So let's do it right after work. As I mentioned, there's eight retirees so from the 2020 school year, the 2021, and this year. We have three retirees from this year specifically, uh, and then five more from the previous two years. So there's eight total that we will be celebrating on the eight. I already mentioned as, as the trustees, we normally give the, the clock to about cabinet making. And here's my recommendation, sort of my ask of the trustees. Uh, that the agenda item is later in the, in the meeting. I would ask that the board approves and authorizes a $250 uh, subsidy, if you want to call it a subsidy, and the $250 specifically, so you, you know there's a tangible item to that $250, that's the specific rental fee for Beaver Brook. Uh, so if the board approved paying the $250 rental fee, that would reduce the onus on the tickets for the staff. And right now we're looking at probably a $25 ticket uh, for staff to attend. That would cover all the, the, the food, okay, the caterer, and that would also include enough money to cover the cost of the retiree and his or her guest. I don't think they should be paying for their own retirement dinner. Okay. And on top of that would be a small gift that we can have as a staff to give in addition to the clock. Uh, so that's, what, that's why you see the motion later in, uh, in the meeting. The big thing is, again, we have three years with the retirees, uh, so it's a bigger event. Uh, normally, we would not have eight in any given year. Any questions about the context of this, this motion that you'll see there? <clears throat> and again, thank you to Deb. I mean, she's been wonderful, picking the phone calls, doing the site visit, picking the menu. So, if you don't like the food, blame Deb. <laughs> <laughs> Superintendent's Award, again, this is another agenda item on the on the agenda. I just want to give you context of this. Uh, this is an annual award uh, given by the superintendent to a staff person. I say staff person, it does not have to be a teacher. Uh, it does not have to be a unit D member. It can be anybody that works for Smith. That exemplifies what we stand for at Smith. Who are we at Smith? And, we, and who is that best person that, that exemplifies that? That's who I want to be as the superintendent awardee. Uh, so this is a perpetual annual uh, award has been given out well before my time here. <clears throat> the awardee's name is added to a perpetual plaque that you can see when you leave this meeting. There are some plaques right outside of guidance. Uh, there's a superintendent's award plaque. You can see all the previous uh, winners. Historically, before last year, uh, the trustees have voted to give the awardee a $500 award. Money, okay? Uh, so I am asking for, on the motion, that the board votes for a $500 gift to be given to this year's awardee. Uh, we typically award, uh, we typically announce the winner at the last faculty meeting. It happens to be June 6th uh, this year. I just want to, the caveat was last year was slightly different because COVID and because everyone here at Smith stepped up and went above and beyond during COVID uh, and made my life a lot easier, Abby's life a lot easier, and quite honestly, the students' lives a lot easier. Uh, we recognize all faculty and staff as the recipients of the superintendent's award last year. Yeah, but we didn't get $500 to every single person. Uh, the board put $250 last year for every single person. So I just want to give, again, full transparency. That's what we did last year. This year, we hope to get back to that individual award winner at $500. So, I won't tell you who the winner is. Uh, I'll tell you after June 6th. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's somebody who's well-deserved. Questions on the superintendent's award? Would you continue the everybody getting the $250 award? I would be open to that. I think this year there is an individual who I really want to recognize for what he or she has done this year. I'll advocate for one this year. I'm open to ideas in the future if we do a, a general. I'm not saying that the board can't give an award to everybody, but I think the superintendent's award this year I think means a lot to one individual. Last year was a COVID specific type of situation. Other districts were doing the same thing. Do you want to tell a little bit more about the criteria that you use or how, what makes a person really jump to your mind? I think if people, uh, I then listen to, I've had a few recommendations, nominations come to me from admin, from teachers. And uh, again, I, when I came to Smith, I, I, I say this to people I died and went to heaven. The people here are by far the best people I've ever worked with. Uh, they're down to earth, they're logical, they're student centered, uh, they get what life is all about. And it makes my job, again, so much easier. And I, I'm looking at you, Dr. Provost. Like, I, I could never do Dr. Provost's job, ever. Uh, and I say that not only for you specifically. 
but all the other superintendents. Um, and during COVID, I'm just sitting there on these meetings. I'm like, wow, like, yeah, we have our issues, but we work really well together. Um, so I'm looking for that individual who just, they come here with the right attitude, a positive attitude. They, they do the job. Um, they know that the students come first. And we're all here because of the students, no matter what your role is. Uh, that's why I look for. Anything else? Yeah, would you consider increasing that the amount of that award? I will never say no to the board if you want to get more money than five hundred dollars. I'm sure the recipient would not be upset. Either. Well, I don't know. I'm history. just giving you past practice. Right. So the history's been five hundred year after year after year. As far as my understanding goes, yes. Okay. The senior banquet, another agenda item. Uh, I want to thank public comment earlier, talking a little bit about the senior banquet. So this year, senior banquet is part of our typical senior uh, events. So we have Memorial Day on Monday, and then the rest of the week, there's something going on with the seniors leading up to Thursday night with graduation. So Tuesday, May 31st, at Lick Park at 6 p.m. is the senior banquet. What is senior banquet? This is something new to me when I came to Smith. It's not what I knew of senior banquets in my previous life. Senior banquet here at Smith is an opportunity for all the seniors to come together with the shop. So they typically eat with the shop, the shop instructors are there. Uh, it's, a, it's a great final time, final dinner, final bonding time with the shop. After dinner, the shop instructors typically get up and they speak on behalf of the students. Sometimes inside jokes, sometimes superlatives, sometimes it gets very emotional, whatever. You know, th those connections and those relationships, again, something I never experienced in my previous life that we see here at Smith. Because, again, these students are with those particular adults every other week, all day long. Uh, you don't have that in a traditional school district. So there's some very strong bonds there on the vocational side. And this is an opportunity to highlight and celebrate those strong bonds. Uh, so the vocational instructors get up, they share some stories about the students. A lot of times they'll either give gifts or special awards to the students. They get all uh, on their own. Uh, it's a wonderful, wonderful evening. As mentioned, uh, this year the tickets are $26 a person, so the seniors who attend have to pay their ticket, $26. Um, obviously there's food uh, that's provided. So as mentioned in the past, again, past practice, I'm just sharing past practice. What the board wants to do, uh, I am open to. Uh, past practice has been the board has, a, has voted to approve approximately 50% of the ticket. So past practice, that would mean a $26 ticket this year. Normally the board would vote for you know, subsidizing about $13. The staff would have to pay the other $13 to attend. <clears throat> yes, in past practice, uh, the board has subsidized any of the trustees who are in attendance, any administrators who are in attendance. Uh, they have not paid in the past. Uh, so. Again, what the board wants to do this evening, it is a motion to subsidize to some level. I'm just giving you the past practice. So. Um, can you speak a little bit to the amount of work that the shop teachers put into preparing for this event? And then also, um, I know it's a, um, it's a limited space, and so I, I don't know if everyone who wants to go can go. Would, if we were to pay for the cost of the vocational teachers to attend. Would we extend that to other um, faculty members or staff people to attend as well? And is there like competition for the seats, like for tickets among the other staff members? <coughs> Great questions. One is a capacity question. Uh, there is a capacity limit. It is, I always forget the number, one. We were told 145 this year. Okay. By the park, I think online it says 175. But that's what our advisors were told is 145. So, as we all know, we're growing. And this is a real problem that we're going to have most likely next year. You know, as we build our class up to 150, we're already going to be up against that capacity limit at Lake Park. So we may have to find a new location study next year. So there is a, a capacity issue. with If all the, the seniors want to go, uh, we do... Let me answer another question before we get back to sort of the, the shop. This is a senior class activity. So the senior advisors are the ones who do a lot of the planning of the logistics of senior banquet. Uh, so they're the ones who will book uh, the location, make sure the caterer is all set up. Uh, they're the ones selling the tickets. Uh, so it's a senior advisor job. But once you get there, the shop instructors do a lot of the work. So they're the ones who most likely went out and buy gifts or 
rewards for the students. They're the ones who gather their thoughts, whether they're funny thoughts or emotional thoughts. Uh, there's a lot of focus on the shop instructors that evening. Uh, so it's a combination of senior advisors and shop instructors. Is there competition for the, the seats? Yes, to a certain level. Uh, a lot of times, we, if we have seats available, we try to uh, offer them to the other class advisors. Almost like a mentoring cycle. So uh, the senior advisors, they are doing all this work. Why can't we get the junior advisors there so they can see what the senior bank was all about as they prepare for the next year? If there's still openings, we go to the sophomore advisors and the freshman advisors. We normally don't have a whole lot of room beyond that. Can we open it up at that point to the academics? Obviously, but I don't think we've ever gotten to that point as far as growth. Uh, that answers the question. Yeah. Other comments, questions? No. Donation. So this is a few items, um, quite unique. I'm just going to jump to, to Ms. Shard here. Uh, she, as a vocational director, received an email from the vocational director from Keeve Tech several months ago. Um, Keeve Tech is in the process of shutting down one of the programs, the graphic arts program. So this is their final year having that particular program. So Keeve Tech is looking to unload all of their equipment from their uh, graphics arts uh, program. So Ms. Shardy jumped on, on, on it as, as an opportunity. Uh, it took her a whole day. And she drove down to Framingham, toured the school, toured the shop. And said yes. Uh, after talking to our instructor, uh, Ms. Jaka, uh, said yes, we want all of these uh, pieces of equipment. Uh, so I thank her for all of the legwork. I want to thank Mr. Smith. Uh, the onus is on us getting all of this equipment from Framingham back to Northampton. So thank you. Uh, but what did all of that work lead us uh, in receiving? Uh, we're getting a challenge 30 inch paper cutter. We're getting an SWF embroidery machine. We're getting a paddy wagon, an ultra fold. Folding machine bomb 714, and finally a Phoenix laminated. So, right, so put the paddy wagon in yeah. front of Yeah, <laughs> I'm a fan. <laughs> Mr. Smith, can you explain a paddy wagon? I, it's not anything what you're thinking. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I. Oh, so. I'm glad the mayor gave clarification. I can't really describe what it is. It's, it's, it's not very elaborate. It's just got a, a funky name. <laughs> um. So again, thank you to all those individuals. Uh, <clears throat> and these were items I know through the budget process, a lot of these equipment items were being asked for. And we're trying to figure out how do we put it in the budget, do we have it in Perkins, and then all of a sudden this opportunity came up, we just couldn't pass forward, so. Uh, Is their shop closing because of low enrollment? Yes. How's all our enrollment in that shop? We're not looking at closing. So, uh, we have a new instructor in there, I think she's doing a great job this year. It's, very positive. I know you can't read this. I'm, I'm sure most of you read this. Uh, this was the Gazette article recently highlighting the uh, animal control facility um, and the meeting all of you. So thank you once again. There's some wonderful press. I just want to highlight that. So looking ahead, as we sort of, people say winding down the year, we always say winding up the year at a high school, things get crazy. Uh, so this Thursday, uh, we have the annual FFA chapter banquet in the cafeteria. On Friday, we have our monthly Hampshire County Superintendent Roundtable meeting. Uh, it's been virtual over the last few years. On Friday night, also, we had the prom. Uh, so that will be up at the log cabin in Holyoke. <clears throat> Next week, we have our final general advisory committee meetings in the morning. Then we have uh, Monday the 30th is Memorial Day, so there's no school on that Monday. I already mentioned Then we sort of run right into senior week. We have the banquet on Tuesday night. We have the Senior Awards Program, which is in the cafeteria uh, Wednesday evening. That's when we hand out all of the academic awards, scholarships, so on and so forth. Another wonderful evening uh, to highlight all of our graduates. And then finally, Thursday, uh, June 2nd, again at 6 o'clock. All these programs are at 6 o'clock, so you don't forget the time. Uh, Dad at Smith College will be graduation on Thursday evening. And then the following week, we have uh, the quarterly meeting with the Commission of the Mob Officers. We'll be meeting with Commissioner Riley on Monday the 6th, and then we have a the next Board of Trustees meeting on the 7th, and I just want to highlight that is earlier than normal, uh, and the rationale behind that is um, I'm going to be at Skills as well. Uh, so I'll be down at Skills in Atlanta the end of June. Uh, that Tuesday I'll be down there, that's when we're supposed to be meeting as a trustee, uh, the Board of Trustees. We looked at the previous Tuesday, uh, that is the final day of school, and 
there's an annual faculty outing bonding moment uh, the last day of school, I would not advise a board of trustees meeting that same night. So we pushed it to the previous Tuesday, which is the 7th. Uh, so it'll be a pretty quick turnaround uh, is our next meeting. So there's no 21st meeting? No 21st meeting. And with that said, I'll turn it back over. Appreciate it. Thank you, sir. This time I'm going to pass to Gerald. Thank you all. Uh, as tradition, I will turn over the beginning of my time to our student rep, Mandy. Um, well, first of all, I have a congestion to allergies, so I'm sorry for my voice. Um, so that, okay. So we have a lot of field trips. Um, going nine, we're going to Bounds, the Trampoline Park, on May 19th. Going ten, is going to Six Flags, June 10th. And then, ele going eleven, we're going to Brownstone, a water in Winter Park, on June 1st. And then, going twelve, just going to the spare time, bowling, you know, on May 25th. And then, for athletics, we have spring sports, uh, JV baseball, as a three to one record with 15 players. It's a, a limited number of games, like this is in school that had in JV, JV programs. Um, our city baseball has a fortune zero record with 13 players also. JV softball has five to 11 with 15 players. Our city softball is also um, with our admissions policy, very excited to say that as of today, 125 out of the 150 enrolled. It is by far uh, the highest percentage of first round acceptees that have registered. So we're looking, sitting at 83.3%. Last year at this time, after the first 150, we were somewhere in the 80 to 90 range that had uh, registered with the school. So as you can tell, that's a huge improvement. Um, <clears throat> additionally, three students have, from the round two acceptance letters have already registered, uh, which that was an additional 26 that we sent out. 
So our current enrollment for next year is already at 128 students, 24 from Northampton, which is 18.75%. And we have uh, three students who have registered to come in as 10th graders next year. We held our last meeting of the year for the school council today, and the student handbook changes were approved. You'll be voting on that later this evening. To reiterate some of the Skills USA information that Mr. Lamore shared, so we had 21 students that participated in the Massachusetts State competition. If you remember, we had approximately 80 students in the district. Uh, we had three gold medals, two silver, two bronze, and again, those gold medalists uh, that are held, heading down to Atlanta are Brian McCullough from Automotive, Jordan Dunn from Criminal Justice, and Nicholas Jacob from Plumbing. We are doing MCAS math testing today and tomorrow. I want to thank uh, Mr. Parks, who as curriculum coordinator is the one who really organizes and takes lead on the MCAS organization and testing, uh, creating the schedule and uh, loading the students, breaking up groups, monitoring all the materials, does a great job. The exploratory uh, committee, you may or may not know, as part of the Explore, we have a four-week Explore program. Those students are graded out of rubric. That rubric score for their week in that shop is what is used to rank them when it comes time to be able to choose the shop that they want. Uh, one of the things that we looked at over the last few years when we redid our admissions rubric, um, we've redone other rubrics and looked at them. So this year, uh, along with Ms. Chardier, myself, led a committee, a small committee. Um, and what we did is we looked at about 25 examples of rubrics from other vocational schools. Uh, we did a survey, of, we, we used those to identify some common themes. We compared it against our own rubric. We then had a survey out to all the vocational uh, instructors. We asked them to rank the elements of the, of the rubric that they felt was most important. Uh, we also asked them opinion on whether it should be a universal rubric or whether it should be a, co a choice rubric or whether it should be a combination. Uh, we then created a draft rubric off of that, which has four elements that are standard, and, and then there's four additional elements that the staff would pick two from. Uh, that then went out to all the instructors to get feedback on that draft rubric. It went to special ed. Ms. Wanzik looked at it to make sure that we were in compliance. And she had some recommended edits around language uh, to make sure that we were, uh, to give you an example, one of, one of the language in the rubric might actually have graded a student down in the way that it was worded because it would have uh, it would have harmed them for using accommodations they have in their in their IEP. So that language, you know, that's what we wanted to look at. Is is the language effective and, and it does it have an unintended consequence? So she was able to get a lot of feedback on that. We had guidance look at it, uh, and then ultimately came back to that committee who made adjustments and changes, and then it went to Dr. Lincoln Hoker uh, for approval. We then have sent it back out to the vocational teachers who are, I did, they're now reporting back which two elements of the choice that they're picking, and then we're going to create editable PDFs so they can do the rubric electronically, uh, and then share it back to guidance at the end of the week electronically. And they'll be specific to their shop, so they'll have the four ones that uh, are mandatory as long as the two that, that they have for choice. Um, as an example, some shops in the choice categories, sh some shops look to uh, grade homework, whereas other shops don't even give homework during that week. But health tech might give homework during that week. Um, so they want to be able to have that fit in an exact part of the scoring rubric so that it makes sense. And then that rubric will be used, it has to be used for the entire year so all students are graded under the same um, auspices. And then if they want to make changes after using it for a year, they would have to make changes for the following year, and then that would become set in stone for that cycle of students as they go through the exploratory. So that'll go into effect next year. And I want to thank Tara Sherman, Max Weider, Mark Nevin, uh, Melanie, who sat on that committee with me. Uh, some personnel updates. So animal science, we have an offer pending. A verbal offer has been made and accepted, and uh, we're pending a a signature on that offer letter. Automotive is in the interview phase. English uh, is in an interview phase. History uh, is in an interview fa phase along with PE, carpentry. Health vocational assistant, uh, that's recently been posted. We were notified of another retirement. 
uh, by the health vocational assistant and health tech uh, for this year. And we're doing, we've also posted a long-term sub for biology. There'll be a parental leave next year at the start of the school year. Uh, update on graduation prep. Just let the board know that the valedictorian, valedictorian is Ella Poudre, salutatorian Jordan Dunham. Ella is in cosmetology and Jordan is in criminal justice. They've both been notified and they've begun working on their speeches uh, with English and history teachers that they've chosen to help them. Uh, as you probably see, the senior salutes are being organized and sent out via email and over our social media. Uh, flowers are going to be ordered for the ceremony and for staff who are attending. Um, and the venue is getting set up and being organized in the sense that uh, John M. Green Hall, we have to start identifying who needs uh, specialized seating uh, due to disabilities or other, other things. That seating is assigned. All other seating for graduation is open seating those tickets. Um, and the senior banquets and senior awards night are in the final stage of preparation. So, pending your questions, that's my report. Any questions? There were two short questions. Um, how are you holding up? It's a, it's a lot of work at this time of year. Yeah, doing yeah. good. Yeah, good. Um, my first question, I, I know I've asked this before, but I, maybe your answer has changed. Um, to what do you attribute the tremendous increase in acceptances um, to the Smith vocational funding? I don't know yet how to explain that. Um, because we've been trending with 50 to 70% acceptance of those over the last eight years that I've been here. Um, so I'm going to have to dig into that. I think one of the things that I want to do that preliminarily jumped in my mind was to send a survey to those students and find out what it was that really drove their decision. <clears throat> I do think that, and I know that Dr. Lincoln Hooker has mentioned it before, I think that the families and the students that are applying um, are much more focused on knowing, whereas I think in the past, we've had students who were unsure. I also think this year that if what the state set up around increasing information around vocational education and around um, schools in particular and, and, and why to go to a vocational school. I do think that several of our sending schools, and not all of them, but we have had a higher visibility. So I think that the students that saw that and were applying, um, I, I think that that probably had an effect. But I, I, I'm not going to know unless I really ask the students and the families what it was that drove them to apply and then ultimately accept it. I heartily endorse that. I think it would be so important to collect that feedback if it's something that you have the time or the energy for um, to find out why they why they've accepted why what made them decide to enroll in, in the form would be awesome. I want to say that I don't participate in Facebook a lot, but because we do have the student seniors on there, there's different pictures school activities, I happen to come across a celebration of a family that the student got his acceptance letter for Smith vocation. Open it up. Went wild. It was like a college acceptance that he was getting into the school. And just wow. And I said you know, it's the old comment, we've come a long way, baby, in regards to what you've been doing, what the teachers have been doing, what Andy's been doing, what the hard work, but to see that reaction for the family cheering, the student cheering, I just want to pass that on and say, as I use it, what's working? Yeah. That was working. I want to tell you, it was really exciting for me to, to know that everybody behind the scenes that, you know, at the end of the day when they go home tired, mm -hmm. that there's people out there thank you. And so, just for that. That's wonderful. Yeah, um, so, two other, just, just two quick questions. Um, one is the, um, if I'm understanding, the rubric is completed <coughs> by vocational teachers after a week in exploratory, the five days that they spent in the shop during the exploratory period. It's it's completed daily by the <coughs> shop instructor that's assigned to do the ninth grade score. Okay. So not all shop teachers might be participating in that, 
Uh, so there's usually a designated instructor who has the ninth graders as they come through. Right. So if I'm the student going through the shops, I am evaluated every day by Correct. the shop teachers. And so I've got those 15 five-day evaluations. Um, yes. So I, I guess I'm curious what prompted you to, to review the rubric, but more importantly, sure. um, are students aware of the criteria by which they're being graded? And um, was there any input from students? Did, did they feel like the old rubric was fair, a fair assessment of their performance? And do they, what did they think of the new rubric? Sure. So uh, I'll take them one at a time. <clears throat> um, the, as far as students having an awareness, it's shared with them at the beginning of the week when they go in. Some shops are more clear than others, though, I will say that. So part of this uh, rubric committee that came out of that was in September. So when the information went out about the rubric going live and you telling us to pick, we let them know that there's going to be a training in September. Um, and part of it is that they're going to have to supply that. We also want to be able to make that known on the shop pages on our website. So when people can go in, they can say, this is the rubric. So they know what choice elements are each particular shop has. So the students know ahead of time how they're being scored. That way, they can have a, a more positive effect. Um, families, there, there were families that came forward and, and did question elements and students who were concerned about some of the language around it. Um, guidance staff and special ed staff had concerns. Uh, also, when we were asking the staff, some staff were already sort of altering it. So it was like this rubric came out, and what we found out is over the last couple of years, some of the programs were kind of altering it on their own. So we didn't have that uniformity. So uh, we want to make sure that it's used uniformly, uh, even though you have the choice elements, which makes it not uniform. But as long as it's being done from group to group and within shop to shop. Um, we had, we, I, don't, I haven't had any student put on the new one yet. Um, <clears throat> I've only been involved since January, and I know there's been discussion about visibility in the middle schools, about being able to go there. Mm -hmm. What's the status of that, seeing you've gotten these better numbers? And you said you haven't been able to determine why. Um, are we getting better visibility in the middle school? We've gotten better visibility in the middle schools. It's nowhere near what we would want. Um, so some schools have allowed our guidance staff to go in and like set up a table in the cafeteria and just sort of passively sit there, mm -hmm. and people can come to them. Other middle schools have been a lot more proactive. Um, I, I know from both sides of it because my daughter goes to Hampshire Regional, um, and. I know from both sides of it that Hampshire Regional actually embedded a lot of what Smith does in the presentation. So they have, um, in the seventh and eighth grade, they have uh, sort of, um, they have designated time where they go through different topics. So it's kind of like a mentor, mentee, advisor, advisor. Uh, and in that specifically, they talked about Smith Boat and they talked about vocational ed versus they, um, the guidance counselors did presentations to eighth grade students. They talked about the benefits of each. They visibly had the kids, you know, they went class by class, so they had them separate and say, who's thinking about applying and who's not? And they had to kind of shift so kids could look at each other and see. And my daughter said people change lines and uh, whatever. <laughs> right. So I think in some areas we've had better visibility than in inroads. Some inroads. And in other areas we're still not even allowed in. So, you know, they're kind of like, we'll handle talking to our students. So that's the next hurdle. <laughs> It is the next because I know in some districts who didn't let us in because I have anecdotally I know people who are in that district. The message there was, yeah, yeah, you know, Smith's great, but you don't really want to go there. You'd rather go to our high school. Uh, and that that was the impression of the students coming home and telling their parents how they were spoken to about it. So I think, yeah, inroads, but we have room to grow or we get it. A uniform message out there. Mr. Aguadro, I'm on the um, Vocational Technical Education Advisory Council to the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education. As, um, as a teacher at the middle school, I saw the, um, the presence of Smith Vocational diminish over the years during the, you know, uh, letting students know about it as an educational option. 
um, there used to be field trips to the school for any students who wanted to go. And that, those were a little while ago, so it just kind of ran down. Um, so I proposed, um, after talking to Dr. Lincoln Hoger and Dr. Provost, a uh, collaborative project where we would pilot, because this is a problem statewide, that um, middle, that vocational schools say that they don't have access to the middle schools that they would like. And then, then there are also district leaders who turn around and say vocational schools aren't admitting all the students that they should be admitting. So I thought our two districts would be a great place to try a, a pilot project where we get the two principals, we get guidance counselors, we get the ELL teachers um, together to say what would a uh, what would be a, a wonderful protocol to uh, deal with some of those issues where you're basically you're dealing competitive around students because students are money to districts. So essentially, you're saying we now have an advocate in the system being in you. For sure. Yeah. Great. Absolutely. Absolutely. I want to ask one question about the school improvement plan. Um, okay, we'll we, have a lot no, this will be short. Um, this, to me, this is the most one of the most important strategic documents um, for the school and for the district. Right? This is what we want to accomplish um, in the school. And I, uh, I see for all of the um, MCAS numbers, mm -hmm. MA, MA, right? And I, I wonder if you could. That's, that's got to make things more challenging in terms of measuring student achievement. Um, so I guess if you could just say a few sentences about um, how, how you cope with that, how you measure the effectiveness of the education here at school vocational, and the role of MCAS at a vocational school versus at an academic high school. Sure. I think to your point, because of the pandemic and the suspension of the, the testing, yeah. Um, and in some cases, uh, even maybe last year's, that we end up being unreliable in really understanding where the students are yeah. in their achievement and what they've been doing. Uh, it, def it definitely makes it more difficult, uh, which is why I think when you look at the uh, farther in, which I'm, I'm sure you have, yeah. you'll see that our goal is pushed to the very end of the plan yeah. uh, because we're hoping that we're going to see some more concrete data around those numbers. The other thing is I think that the, because the state changed its uh, accountability and scoring, and now you probably see in the articles where it's interesting that, you know, out of the pandemic, you hear so much being talked about how there's a gap in education, um, and that we don't, haven't had reliable testing, and a lot of these students are, you know, you're moving to computer-based testing, trying to make the testing window smaller. Maybe they're gonna go to smart testing, similar to some of the other, uh, like licensing for adults, where the test shuts off because it you know, gives you a combination of easy, medium, hard, and then ultimately shuts off when it, and it says, no, you're good enough. Um, I think the talk around making it harder and increasing the standards at this point in time, I, I don't know enough of what data they're seeing, so I think, to make a judgment. I think it's interesting, and, and I, I definitely want to know more about why they're looking to make the MCAS exam harder. Um, I think what's great for us is when you, if you look at our numbers uh, compared to someone else, and so if you take like mathematics and English, they only have, you know, the one year 2020 of of, um, of the NA yeah. because we actually had scores that we could look off of last last year, and you can see that our needs improvement went up and our proficient went down. Um, but I think part of it is that. We could be misjudged on the MCAS. So, we, you know, I always tell the parents and the students when they first come that we're, we're asking you to double major. We're asking you to do a vocational program, and I need Mandy to talk about it from her perspective, but we're asking you to double major. We're asking you to learn, in her case, we're asking her to learn how to fix autom automobiles and, and, and trucks and SUVs, you know, to learn how to work on vehicles. And at the same time, in half the time of what her peers are getting at another school, where they have 180 days of a, of a, of a subject um, every year, we're asking them to pass these state exams. And, and um, so I, I think it's a big testament to the school that our, our, our data is as, as good as it is, and all those schools are as good as it is, uh, because if they are, we're asking students who maybe in their other districts weren't viewed as traditional learners, maybe they're looked at as hands-on, or in this case we have almost 50%, you know, 45% special ed, and, and they're all passing the MCAS, yeah. you know, in half the time. Right. You know, we're giving them some 
extra math in ninth and tenth grade um, and English, but that's a huge deal. I mean, the, the students have to be proud of themselves, and I know we are when we look at what they're able to accomplish. So I think it does. Ha it, it is hard when we look at strategic planning if that's really all we focused on. But I think because we focus on on so much more and the amount of um, intervention that we do, and I, I think you know. To give you an example, we have a MCAS um, prep, prep course, right? The next week, after, because MCAS is over, it's going to shift into a, in, for the last couple of weeks or a week and a half, it's going to be science prep. So we're going to reshuffle the groups and we're going to prep for, um, you know, the biology exam and the physics exam. So we're going to change that up. Uh, so I think we do a really good job trying to come up with interventions and trying to focus on what the students need again. Like Dr. Lincoln Oper said, where we know that it's the students, they're the priority. That's why we're here. And how do we do that? Um, and it, but that's you know comes from Mr. Parks, and it comes from the staff that just says, well, we why are we we don't need to do this anymore. It doesn't make sense. Let's shift it to science. And they we do that you know all the time. And then we try to give them a leg up and go from there. So, um, and in other cases where we we're trying to get special ed instructors dual license. Yeah. Uh, so we've been paying for those licenses to take the test so that we can have a special ed teacher that's also licensed in English and a special ed teacher that's also licensed in math so that you know we're not supposed to have what might be tradi traditionally pull out programs but here we have a licensed teacher that also has a SPED license that's able to teach maybe our, our bottom 10%, 15% that really need that extra intervention. So there's like another example. Uh, I think it's those kinds of things. And, Mr. Parks usually runs a data analysis team that meets, and we look at, we try to look at the data and figure out, well, what does that really mean, and where are our, our target opportunities? So I think part of it is we just have a great team. <laughs> Everybody's focused in their areas, and they're all trying to do what they can within their area. And the MCAS isn't seen as punitive; it's seen as a measure of success. I think it's seen as, speaking for me. I think it's seen as a hill that we all have to climb together. Fair enough. Thank you. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Chairman? Yep. Ms. Holder's report? Yep. Um, I just got some lists of projects underway or, or planned and purchases. Every single one of these have been affected by supply issues. So they're all the way. Uh, starting with the outside sign, the new sign we were supposed to have in April. Um, Watchfire should be delivering it to Springfield and Holy Signs this week or early next, and then they need a month or so to build a custom base to fit our existing footing. So they're thinking um, end of June, early July, the sign will be up, unless something happens. Mm -hmm. um, the security vehicle we ordered for uh, Kevin, it should be in Greenfield by by this month, and then they have to put our additions on our, our doors and all the additives. Um, the hybrid car still can't get as we said they won't price it they won't take a order um, they're still holding out um, the window project's been put off till start in december february and next april vacation due to manufacturer's delays on the windows um, they did submit a some glass that i don't think we didn't like it was too light it was almost clear through it wasn't this tinted bronze that we have so i don't think that's going to add any time to we're already delayed so much um, the new lockers for criminal justice, Ag Mech, and um, plumbing shop arrived last week, but we're going to wait till the kids leave now and put them in as soon as summer gives. Um, so we're planning to put air conditioning in the seat building, and the preliminary <coughs> design is already done. I'm going to walk through with the engineer next week, uh, firm up any details that, that don't seem right, and hopefully we put that out to bid. And I think that's going to be another project that would be done during the winter months. And then <coughs> June, or the first heat wave, they can come in and start it up. So it'll be good for next year. Um, but everything's been delayed. We had bought that uh, skid steer for the egg shot uh, farm last year. We're still waiting for attachments to have them come. Um, it's been a year. So nothing has been um, uh, spared. Um, and the sidewalk job, so which I thought was just going to be a, a quick job, put in new sidewalks, there they are. And the architects kind of came, and we're looking at either side of the building, and it's asphalt, which I never understood why, but the elevations are so drastic from the building to the side to the road that it, 
your sidewalk can't be, your, your concrete couldn't be flat because you'd have to step up to the red brick and then every doorway would just step into it. So he wants me to get a, a crew in here and do site work, which, I mean, uh, just get grades, but I think I'm going to go back and let's mimic what they did, upgrade everything, just mimic what they did. So that, that's my opinion. about that boiler problem that kept shutting itself off? What's the way um, The brand new boiler ran for three months. The, the heat pump uh, dissolved. And it just, the bearing went, and uh, it, they haven't brought back. They have swapped both those pumps out. So luckily they haven't needed that. Was that under a warranty situation? Yep. Okay. Yeah. But they must be having trouble getting that. Uh, that's too Adams for me. They're, they're, they're really good company, so I, I, I don't have a problem with them. Just, just a problem with them. I'm sure you report. Thank yep. you. Other new business? May I have a motion and a second to approve an option <coughs> over that trip to Atlanta, Georgia for the National Skills USA competition June 20th through the 25th of 2022? So moved. So moved. Seconded. Thank you. Any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. We have a motion to second approve a payment of uh, FY21 invoice to Florence Paint for $155.97 from facilities. So moved. Second. Thank you. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. We have a motion to second to approve the <coughs> 22. Yeah, 2025 school improvement plan. So moved. Again. Okay. Further discussion? All in favor? Okay. Right. Oh, Abby, can I ask the board to make an amendment? Sure. Please. So, in light of um, Dr. Lincoln Hooker's recommendation to say that he asked, uh, and the amount of time that it's going to take us and, and our staff members to go through the self studies, uh, I don't think that the goals under curriculum instruction, which had a June 2023 deadline, uh, which was to investigate a hybrid OSHA training and an entrepreneurship seminar series, um, as well as under college and career readiness, uh, the shop information handouts and the updates to the program uh, handbook. I would ask that the board please <coughs> someone make a motion to Accept this with an amended anticipated completion dates of one year later, June 2024, as opposed to 23. Um, I just don't want to throw that burden onto the staff who have to carry out these initiatives in this plan. Uh, we will keep under the climate, though, uh, those anticipated completion dates of June 2023 uh, for the assembly series, where we're looking at alumni and guest speakers around career college. Uh, as well as uh, to continue the common themes and messaging around campus for students and staff. We're already working with graphics along that initiative and, and other groups. So, well, I'd like to do it if I may. I'd like to table that for tonight and then bring it up at our next meeting so that you can bring copies and have everybody. I'm comfortable. Just changing the dates. Yeah, just changing yeah. the dates. So, okay. so, so just the date. Yeah. Right. yeah, so we've got the, like, the plan right here. Instead of June 2023, it'll say June 2024. So I'll, I'll make that motion here. Okay. Um, Thank you. Second. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. We have a motion and a second to approve the updates to the 2022 to 2023 student handbook. Second. Third discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 We have a motion and a second to approve and declare a portion of the land of Smith Vocational Agricultural High School surplus and no longer needed for school purposes and to transfer to the care, custody, and control of such property to the City of Northampton for brief designation as an animal control facility. So moved. Second. All in favor? Is this in perfect Yeah, we have to. We have to Turn it over to the city in order to do that. Perfect. Yeah. So, if I can just get a little bit yeah, of please. Uh, I think, like the Spencer Robinson, you we were kind of touching that. You know, what is this for? Yeah. Uh, and just as a reminder for the board, uh, probably the previous board voted on, uh, when DPW came to the board and asked for, I believe it was the Pump House project up at Forest, 
similar situation where if there's current school property uh, that the city wants to have a building on, we technically have to surplus that stand of land back to the city through surplus and they can then build a building. So uh, it's not out of the ordinary. We've done this a few different times. Uh, this is just one of those times to formalize. Uh, again, as a reminder, this plot is down back, kind of near the current GCC building, tennis courts, hospital property. I think you see in your packet sort of the, the outline of the kind of Appreciate the So the area has not changed. Nothing has changed. Uh, this is just one of those formalities that have to occur for the Perfect. Okay, question. Yes. Um, I don't know how to word this, so I'll try to word it. Can there be any deed restriction in regards to the shops being part of the building of this new facility? Deed restrictions. Or whatever. Um, some type of an agreement with the city that the, the shops would be able to be involved without just this kind right. of the building use agreement. Is that what you would ask? Yeah. Well, I mean, just like the health center that, that we're proposing, that's number one that we definitely work on to help the school involved in either, either project. As far as the decision making in regards to the architectural and our participation, we're coming to mm -hmm. I would say at this point, in our initial meetings, I think the more Participation from the students would be a win-win. I think it's a great opportunity for the students, and I think from the city's perspective, potential costing. So, I'm not hearing any rebuttals from the city saying that students cannot participate. It would no, be like, to, be able to. to the extent that the school is comfortable. Right. Is the land owned by the city? It's under our work. We own but it's control and custody from the city. <clears throat> okay, so go back to the number of I'm going back to it. So make sure that I like it who's on first. Okay. So again, I'm gonna ask any further discussion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. May have a motion and a second for discussion of possible action to approve uh, as stated earlier uh, five hundred dollar superintendent award. Comment. You want to move first? Yeah, motion. Let's move Say first. So move. Uh, okay, a motion to increase it. Um, I think. That has to be amended. Yeah, so move to do it. I'll yeah. second, and then we'll discuss. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So say so moved. <laughs> so moved. Second. Okay, now say so you want to amend it. Uh, amend it to uh, increase the award of five hundred dollars to. Six hundred dollars. Can I second the amendment? Second the amendment. Second it. Because your thinking is that it's been five hundred for a long time, and inflation and cost. Do we know how long it's been five hundred? Seems the get go. What's the get go? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh -huh. Quite a few years. Two thousand. <laughs> When Rick, when um, Frank Baum is starting, it's 2001. So I'd like to, since last year was different, this is a good time to change it to a new amount going forward. Is there additional money in the budget to the So this would be coming from the trustee so accounts that was outside the operating budget. Okay. Right. And is there money in the trustee accounts? Yes. Oh, yes. <laughs> so they have a motion in the second on the amendment. To increase to six hundred dollars. A motion. Yeah, I think we have that. Better than on the floor. Yeah. So, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. We have a motion in the second for discussion of possible action to approve subsidizing the cost of the senior banquet. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor? Uh, I would like to. I think the. I, if I am understanding, Ms. we met her comment um, earlier, the idea that um, we should make an adjustment. Either trustees should pay some of the cost of their own tickets or 
um, we should fully subsidize the teachers. And uh, I guess it speaks to the mayor's question about how much money we have to spend on something like that. And also, I want to know how many vocational instructors are there who would be going? So we have 15 shops, yep. so at least one. So that's 15 yep. to 35 in the ballpark. So anywhere from 15 to 35 vocational instructors. So about $600, is that right? $650, something like that. To, if we were to pay for all of the vocational instructors. <coughs> so I, 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 I'm thinking of the amount of work that has to go in. You know, but everybody's doing it. There's so much work for teachers to do at the end of the year, and this is an additional amount of work. And it sounds like it's very much appreciated by the students. <coughs> and it's great for the school culture. Um, so I guess I would advocate for subsidizing. Yeah. So I guess I'll can I just ask for clarifying. Yeah. If there's going to be a line or not a line. <coughs> so I'm hearing the motion to cover. Trustees, administrators, vocational <coughs> Right. There's two senior class advisors. There's potentially other class advisors. And back to the question that was posed earlier, which is the question, if there's ever capacity, if we open it up to academics, is there, are we opening up to all adults, covering all adults, or is there categories that the board wants to support? I just want to have that answer. In my mind, categories, vocational uh, educators, for the time that they put into it and the class that they <coughs> I'm getting it. <laughs> would others pay the full or would the others be subsidized at the past practice of 50%? If the junior advisors or an English teacher who had the seniors in class and wants to be there. What's your recommendation? What are your thoughts? Personally, I think we're talking about so few in that other category. I would just cover that. If we're going to cover through three vocational instructors, we're talking probably on one hand to the other. I think it would be the right thing. So Obviously. will there be like a lottery, like for the teachers who want to go? If there's X number of seats in there, the tickets are paid for, and there are more people who want to go than there are tickets. You're having an extra capacity. Yeah. Right. So there could be potentially a capacity situation if this right. starts to snowball. Right. Yeah, well, I mean, absolutely. Or we find another venue like so I would try to to advocate and support and speak on behalf of the board. I would try to keep tight rein on the adults who show up, just to respect. Yeah, I guess it's not a free for all. I sort of lean, I don't know, I guess I sort of lean towards the people. I, in my mind, thinking that they're putting in extra work in, on top of all of the other extra work that teachers do at the end of the year and things that they show up for. Is there an, an, like an academic equivalent to this? To a lesser degree, it would be the senior awards like the following. <clears throat> um, are no vocational awards are given at the senior awards? Like they're allowed to. So it's, it's both. So I guess I'm thinking this is just for the shops. The uh, vocational the teachers senior. have the work of coming up with the awards and the, the tributes that are given to the students. And so I, I guess I would, but then I don't like the idea of not paying for others, <coughs> but I guess I'm seeing vocational instructors and class advisors, the senior class advisors. Right. What, what are your thoughts? No, and then the other then teachers think, buy a ticket if they want to go? Correct. And I think that if, if we want to look at next year for the other I think that's part a great it, idea. I think, I think that yeah. would be. So this year, do that and next year. Vocational and senior thing. advisors. Correct. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That, that helps. Okay. So, so, so I can't attend on the 25th. Anyway, I'm going to go down as well. So, all in favor? Aye. 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 Um, so, also, uh, the discussion of possible action, a vote to approve subsidizing costs for the retirement <coughs> celebration, which is uh, being presented at $250. So moved. Second. Second. And the retirees as well, right? Correct. Yeah. But what we're doing, we're covering, we're covering the hall rental. Oh, that's it. 
hook up. And, and if we charge $25 okay, gotcha. a ticket, okay, right. that's enough to cover. Okay, there, the cost yeah. of the tickets. Got it. Thank yeah. you. So just, yeah, so sorry. Right. So, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. I have a motion to second and approve the following surplus for resale from Health Technology 28. 2016 American Red Cross packet for teaching CPR first aid DED in one standing office model detectable scale for height and weight. We need a motion in a second. Thank you. Thank you. Further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Future business, June 7th. Regular Board of Trustees meeting at 5 o'clock here in the library, July 19, 2022. Board of Trustees planning retreat, 1230 to 4 here in the library. <coughs> the same date, July 19, 2022. Regular Board of Trustees meeting at 5 p.m. here in the library. August 16th, it's a tentative regular Board of Trustees meeting at 5 o'clock. Upcoming events, we've already covered. May 31st, the Senior Banquet, 6 o'clock at Oak Park. June 1st, Senior Awards Night, 6 p.m. at the cafeteria here. June 2nd, graduation of John and Ray Greeny Hall at Smith College. And Senior John's got here, you can get the book. Moment for pleasure. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. Appreciate everybody's time and effort.